Let's see around. Hello. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so we'll probably get started right about now. Um, so uh, welcome, Dr. Ben Martin, who's going to talk to us about uh, ODF and standards and all that fun stuff. So, yeah. All righty then, as the, uh, the signs basically said, if anyone wants to talk about Libferris or robotics or things like that, as well as ODF, come and see me. Um, is that echo happening for everyone? Like the audio echo, or is that just from my point of view? Okay. I'll just go on then. So the first rule of my talk is to buy the person doing the test or testing a beer. Um, a lot of people, when I report that there's errors or things crash, uh, the response is, no, it doesn't crash. And I sort of say, well, you know, if it crashes for me, it's likely to do it for you as well. And from the other side of the fence, I've been um, freelance developing open source. And when I was working on FontForge, the main thing I'd ask people when, when they said that it was crashing was, can you send me a font that actually does this? Like, as soon as I can get it to crash on my machine, I can fix that. So the tester is really someone who, in some companies, the tester is the evil guy who sits in the corner and breaks stuff, and you're sort of you're trying to avoid them. But really, the tester is there to be a friend because you know the users are going to find the bugs if the tester doesn't. So uh, the ODF specification, open document format, uh, the 1.2 is a number of years old now. Um, basically, you have a single file which is a zip container, and there's a bunch of XML files, and if you have pictures, they're in there as well. And you can have RDF inside of the ODF, so you can do semantic web type stuff in your uh, office document sort of stuff. Uh, the spec's about 800 pages long. As part of the testing, I should sort of say that I found bugs in Word, bugs in LibreOffice, bugs in my own test suite, and also bugs in the ODF specification itself. Uh, sometimes attributes are set, uh, have seven values, um, and you can only have one of those seven values, but they don't stipulate the default. So everyone's supposed to sort of guess the same default. Um, there are a few edge cases like that where it should, it should be said, but uh, it's not so much. Um, everyone has their own test suite. I'm pretty sure that Microsoft would have their own test suite for Word and things like this, and LibreOffice certainly have a massive one. Uh, so what's the point in me coming along and deciding to run my own tests? Um, the main thing that I was looking at was data preservation. A lot of uh, Office, when they're testing Word or they're testing LibreOffice, they're saying, does it crash onto these documents? Um, does it load this and does it show an underline? And they're not so much interested in, does it load this ODF file and then when I save it back again, does it save back all of the attributes and elements in the same positions? Which is what I'm after because if you are writing an ODF thing and you have a table and you say, I'd like to apply this style to my table header and I'd like to apply this style to these cells in the table and you save it, you're expecting that it's going to go into a certain place. And if that data doesn't go into the same place with all of the office suites, some of the other ones are going to load it and they're not going to see where, the, where LibreOffice has put an automatic style. They're going to expect that there's actually a, st a style in styles XML and you'll start losing data when you start using two different products. So my main thing is to look through and say, here's ODF files, you can load them, you can save them, but I want to make sure that when you save them back again, attributes that I've put in there are still in there and they're still in an expected location. Uh, the main target, because the ODF 1.2 specification is gigantic, um, I've picked out these uh, XML elements in the ODF spec and run through every attribute and run fairly exhaustive testing. If an attribute's an enumerated type with three or seven or ten different p allowable values, I've got a test that runs each individual allowable element. Um, if it's uh, just a numeric type, obviously, like I just pick, you know, one inch, one centimeter and run a few different tests at point sizes and things like that because there's no point. If it, if it can preserve a two-inch space, it's going to preserve a 20-inch space. Uh, some people in the lead-up to this have asked whether I've done fuzz testing, which is, I haven't even got to that level. That would be very interesting, just sort of handing random garbage through in attributes and seeing how badly things fail. Uh, but everything I've done has been trying to test completely valid ODF files that are not... Alrighty. I don't know if there's anything I can do about these squealing noises, but uh, yes, um, everything I've done is basically completely um, validating ODF files. I'm not trying to break office suites, I'm trying to see what office suites can load and what they're going to save and, you know, basically provide feedback to people who are writing LibreOffice or Word and say, 
Um, you're doing great with headers and footers, but this fairly common attribute in headers and footers isn't implemented. Maybe you should, you know, it'd be interesting to look at adding that. So then the whole scenario gets better for everyone. Uh, the office suites I tested were more or less what I could get my hands on. Um, so AbbeyWord and Caligra and Numeric. Um, I wrote a bridge to upload stuff to Google Drive and then download ODF exports, so Google Docs. Um, you get to see whether or not they're interested in preserving things and, uh, and how, how things go. Uh, LibreOffice 4 and 5, and I've also tested on OS X and on Linux for LibreOffice. And um, I have a licensed copy of uh, Office 2016, and I have friends who have 2013 because you can't easily install multiple different versions of Word on the same machine, so you need to have different machines for, for each version of Word, and Web ODF, which allows you to edit and view ODF files in a web browser. And uh, depending on whether you're on uh, Windows or on Windows OS X or on Linux, you, you sometimes get different renders. I've been told that the PARs in, in LibreOffice are using the same libraries across different platforms now. But I've also seen things like um, word breaking in particular because you've got different fonts on different platforms. So you'll have a, a single line as this long and then it'll break here and it'll break in a different location if you're on Windows which a lot of the time doesn't really matter, but it, it could possibly matter depending on you know, the semantics of the document. Um, what, was the, what, was the, what was the outcomes of it all? I was expecting drop data. Um, I didn't expect crashes because, as I say, these are all very small, like a two or three kilobyte ODF file. And I've crashed LibreOffice and I've crashed Word 2016. Um, I've told everyone on Teams, every time I meet someone on one of the Teams, I have files that you might want to look at. Um, LibreOffice are actually quite good with this. They have a publicly viewable section. Every time a file that crashes LibreOffice is reported, they just add that to the collection. So not only do they check and fix it for now, but for releases in the future, the same Office document just keeps getting loaded and they see, you know, has it started crashing again, which is a huge plus. Uh, sometimes things just refuse to load. Uh, this can come down to, I mean, you can easily do this with a mangled ODT if you just use zip. Uh, if you don't have the MIME type as the first file in the zip, uh, a lot of things like LibreOffice, and rightly so, will report that it's a corrupted file. Uh, but if you have a completely legal file, especially if you're having styles in tables and you have the style defined in styles XML, um, a lot of things will pop up dialogue saying this is actually mangled. And you can usually recover because it's all in XML anyway. I mean, this, the good part with ODF is that if things refuse to load, you can still get to the information because it's in a somewhat human readable form in XML. Um, some gotchas when I was doing testing were things like uh, Caligra likes to let you know that it has a lot of precision by when you're saving three points, it'll say it's three point, you know, six zeros points. Uh, and when, when I'm doing XPars to actually see whether things are written back, I take this into account. Uh, if I define a margin or something in inches and something converts it to centimeters, I actually consider that to be invalid because if you're, yes, you can say that uh, one inch is like, you know, 2.54 centimeters, but you're still losing information. So then if you load that something like that into something that wants to convert it back to inches again, you'll lose again and you'll just, you know, it doesn't really converge or it may converge at some strange random point. Um, anything that's not mandatory in the 800 page specification, there's going to be a little surprise that's waiting to sort of jump up and get you. Um, part of the more interesting part, a lot of this was done with an automated harness where I generated thousands of ODF files, but then from the results I went back and said, uh, if LibreOffice is failing at all of these things with tables, um, surely it's not that bad. People use tables in LibreOffice all the time. So then it was a matter of second guessing what they were doing that I was not doing. I was not expecting um, styles to be in automatic styles, and they tend to like styles being in automatic styles rather than styles XML and sort of ignore the later. So second guessing, and Word also had a case which is coming up where what they were doing was not, not standard compliant, but it was not something that you would intuitively think this is what you would do. Um, perhaps in that case because they're sort of, they're supporting multiple document formats. So uh, as a, a way in which their other formats were, were written before that uh, sort of followed on to how styles were being handled in ODF. Uh, sort of mentioned, uh, how many people are actually reasonably familiar with ODF if you're cracking it open as a zip file? Okay, so um, that's handy. I should have asked that right at the start. Um, the main document in your ADF file is in content XML, which is a, a file in the actual zip. 
And the styles XML is sort of meant to be where all of your, your styling information goes and you link via names of styles from text in Content XML. Uh, and you also have uh, automatic styles in Content XML, which I think is for if you just embolden something or you apply a font to something, but you don't actually say this is a style and you don't want to have a name on it. But obviously it needs to have some way of saying, you know, this is the font, these are the properties that I want to apply to that piece of text. So that gets, becomes an automatic style because you're not so much interested in the preservation of the style name in that case. You just want a slight change in the, the layout or the character properties or the text. Uh, in some cases, um, for the font style name and font family, you need, in order to have something valid, you can't just have a single XML attribute. Um, you need to have two or three because if you don't have two or three, the spec basically says that when it's loaded, uh, the Office application is free to ignore that one attribute because it just doesn't make sense in isolation. Uh, as you go along, things like margins, you need to have multiple, you need to have like a small bit of text, like a hello world for testing really simple things. But if you're testing margins, um, unless you have some text that goes for multiple pages, you're not going to be able to see the difference of a, a one inch or a three inch margin. So as well as testing round trips, um, when the document's loaded, it actually takes screenshots so that you can see, you know, if you have an underline tag, you can actually see whether the underline tag is valid. And in the results of the, text, of the test harness, you can click through and see the content XML and the styles, both of the file that's loaded and also the file that's saved back. So you can quite easily drill through the results and see what it's making of, uh, of this data that you've given it. And if it's, if it's ignoring an underline or something like that, you can see has it fully ignored it or has it just sort of mutilated that into something else? And that might be okay. If you're going to use LibreOffice and it happily mutilates it into something else and can load what it's done, that might still be acceptable for what you're doing. But in some ways, knowing that that's happening, because if you have that and it's in a format that uh, LibreOffice is expecting to see but Microsoft Word 2016 doesn't know about, and you send that to someone with Word 2016, they're going to have a trouble seeing what you want them to see. Uh, some other test catches, um, not really, I work on some font software on the side as well and I'm not really uh, that fluent in any language other than English so working out uh, in some cases whether something that's uh, Ruby text and things like that actually does sane things, um, I can't possibly read it but seeing whether it's actually doing what the attribute that I'm playing with would, would want it to do. So uh, the core of the test suite as far as whether things pass or fail is to inspect the saved XML and check whether or not the attributes that were, the key attributes that were in the actual document that you've sent to the office suite are still preserved in the same location with a, a similar sort of way. So if Caligra wants to say it's 3.0000 point, I'm happy to accept that because it's, there's no data loss. If there was a one at the end or something like that, it would be a different value. Ah, yes. The writing of, of style information, again, getting back to the fact that you've got uh, four different places where style information can be, and with LibreOffice, if you want to style tables, you definitely want to use automatic style in the current version. Apparently, that's being worked on to allow it to actually use the styles XML for, for style. And I found a very interesting thing when trying to uh, test things that were close to default values. And again, this comes down to the specification in some cases not stipulating what the default is for enumerated types. So if you were saying, here's a document and um, I would like this text to be styled in Helvetica, and on the version of Word you were using, it just happened the default style was Helvetica. So in that case, the default paragraph style had Helvetica and it would quite happily say, I'll just, I don't need to write that for the, the test style because the default paragraph is going to be in Helvetica. So it could move and elevate something that you were testing for to the parent style. And therefore, because it's uh, the way the XML is laid out, it says test style, here are all of the attributes for that. And by the way, my parent style is paragraph. So you look at paragraph and it says, now I'm using a font family of Helvetica at this particular size. So in the, in, uh, in the testing, if you've got your XPath going through saying test style should say that it's Helvetica, you're not going to see that. So to get around that, um, a lot of the tests that were close to things that might be sane defaults, if you wanted to have a transparent background, for example, on a paragraph, which a lot of things would say, ah, oh, transparent background, why do you even tell me that? It's a transparent background to begin with. But you want to test with the, the fact that it's going to save that because the transparent background might actually make a difference at some point. 
So there's no, you know, at some times it might be valid to throw it away, but you want to be knowing that it can actually preserve transparent backgrounds because in cases where you've got a, a red background and it's transparent, it's going to make a difference as opposed to just being on a white page. So to get around the fact that a lot of the attributes that were close to the default are then defined in inverted style, saying I want a really hot pink background, but then I want to have this as being a transparent background. So then it makes a difference because you're no longer having text just on plain white, but you've got a pink background and then you're, you're saying you want to have that transparent. So it's no longer close to the default paragraph style because you've got this horrific style in between the default paragraph and what you're testing for. And that actually worked quite well with, uh, with Word, uh, which had the, the habit of elevating the style to the parent style. And if you had, that, um, if you had a, a parent style in between yourself and the default paragraph with, with an inversion of what you're testing for, it, couldn't, it could no longer say transparent, couldn't move up to the paragraph because the paragraph itself has a, um, an inverted style there. So you're stopping it from moving it up, basically. Uh, the distilled findings were the, probably the most interesting thing. The whole result set is online on autotests open document format .org, which was the link at the very start, and it's there at the end. So if you want to see for each individual attribute of all of these elements uh, how well LibreOffice 4 or LibreOffice 5 did, or whether you can expect to have really funky squiggly lines or underlines or broken underlines through text and also underlines that ignore white space, which is something that Word 2016 does and LibreOffice doesn't like doing. Uh, quirks of ODF. Um, diagonal strikes in cells work okay if you're doing uh, spreadsheets in LibreOffice, but um, a lot of the spreadsheet things actually apply to tables in ODF documents, and ironically in this case you can, um, you can add the slashes in Word 2016, but if you try and save them it actually drops them. But there's no way through the UI in LibreOffice to add slashes to um, the diagonal slashes to documents rather than the spreadsheets. Um, apparently, ODT paper tray name, which um, used to allow you to select a paper tray name for when you're printing, because you don't need to know what printer it is, because you only have one printer and you have multiple paper trays on the same printer. But that one's not going to be there in a future ODF, so there are still interesting little warts. Um, DR3D allows you to do 3D rendering in documents, and I haven't seen a great deal of support for that, so I was sort of saying, uh, when I was speaking with some people on the ODF board, maybe uh, some of the more um, out there type things that are in the spec, like the 3D rendering, uh, should become an optional feature. So you get a possibility that a lot more suites can implement more of the, the core spec, because at the moment there's a lot of stuff in ODF 1.2 that there's just no support for. So you have the 800 page document and users are supposed to guess whether or not you know, LibreOffice does this or does that. Uh, another little interesting quirk, which I haven't seen, maybe there's a, a great use for this, but LibreOffice allows you to do this and won't allow you to do broken underlines. So you can have a, um, a character at the start and end of a block of text and quite happily mark that up and they're both four and five are quite happy to load and save that. Um, another thing with, with uh, where were we? Um, disk below, LibreOffice was happy to do. And uh, Calligraphy would actually strike through with waves, so you can have your wave rather than direct strike through. Um, this was an interesting one, ODF text line through text. You can have a string, instead of actually having a strike through as a, a continuous line, you can uh, apply a string to be overwritten over your text. Uh, but optionally in the ODF spec, it can just take the first character. So in this case, some things decided, and again, there was no stipulation whether the character needed to be repeated. So in this case, you could say, my character is just A, and then the entire line would just have one A in the middle of it in some things. But in LibreOffice, it would just stamp A over the entire line, character for character. So I'm not sure whether or not... Uh, I suppose this was the core of my point that maybe the ODF 1.3 spec should have a, a subset, because there's a lot of strange features that if you're going to have um, a string being as your overline, um, a lot of people are probably not going to use, but there's a lot of features like having an underline broken uh, halfway through text so that the underline doesn't continue through white space that might be, most people might be interested in having. And just knowing that, um, well, in some way being able to work out the interesting attributes and have every office suite aim to actually do those rather than a random sort of collection of I can do a capital A and a capital Z at the start and end of a line 
which you can do it in many other ways anyway. So um, the uh, underline skip white space actually works in Word 2013 and 16, and a few other little. Uh, yeah, you can actually do a text display none in a lot of things as well. So the more interesting and serious stuff was that. Um, and this, the LibreOffice bug where it's wanting to save the styles in um, content XML and also placing them in automatic styles is apparently something that's being worked on as a summer of code thing. So it may be sometime in the next year or two you'll be able to do that. And well, you'll, be, you'll be able to have styles that are going into styles XML and preserve their name, uh, which is a better way than saying you could do that. Um, to me, that's very interesting because if you're running an organization and you have table cell properties and things like that, you're going to want to be able to go through and change entire collections of documents. And if they're in automatic styles, you can't look things up. Like it becomes one of these implicit, um, is this actually using this style or is it just using, and then you can sort of say, oh, but it's the top left cell and things like that and try and, try and imply what style it was supposed to be using because your style name is no longer there because you're in automatic style. Uh, if you have table properties, then this was a case where basically I had um, refusal to load, um, which is okay, I think. Um, but it's, well, it's much better than a, a crash. So again, if you were playing around with table properties, um, it's an area where the current implementations of ODF 1.2 don't do as well as a lot of people would probably expect. Again, this was the table cell properties was sort of a bug in the specification itself because the spec didn't say explicitly that these needed to be in the styles XML. It just seems that it makes sense to the reader. Um, so it's again one of the issues that has been raised with the, the spec itself, uh, rather than I mean the implementation was moving to change to to be how people would expect anyway. But if you don't specify explicitly you must do this, then everyone's going to do it in a slightly different way. Um, I found that basically WebODF was quite happy to preserve things. Um, that's one of its main goals was that it wouldn't lose information. It may not render it correctly, but when it loads and saves an ODF file, you're going to get the same attributes back again. And it was fairly rare that I would see uh, attributes dropped. Um, a lot of the cases, a lot of the times it wasn't rendering what you would expect, but it's much better, I think, to preserve data and then work on how it's going to be presented rather than you know, just throwing away data but presenting it okay. And the final test of my hypothesis with the LibreOffice 4 was basically creating handcrafted documents with the table properties in the automatic styles, which it was very happy to load and very happy to respect. But as soon as you put them anywhere else, it didn't really like you. Which is exactly what that slide is saying. Uh, section properties were very uh, poorly supported throughout a lot of the Office suites. Um, I had some things like Caligura decide that a section property was really a paragraph property, which is not really the case, but uh, I suppose they're doing something rather than just ignoring a section property. And again, LibreOffice wanting to put things back in automatic styles, even though you have an explicitly named style for section properties. So it's sort of a, a recurrent theme with LibreOffice that you can style things and Again, if you're using LibreOffice and you style tables and you style sections and you save them when you load the documents back in again, it all looks okay. So unless you're looking at the ODF and breaking it apart, you probably don't know that they're doing something that you may not want. Um, this One of the margin things, I actually had uh, cases where I was break, uh, where I could crash LibreOffice with certain margin settings. Um, Again, any time that there's been crashes, I've already reported to Upstream saying, you know, yeah, this might be something that's interesting to fix. Uh, the only thing that I've seen as far as the suites, all the suites that I was testing with LibreOffice, if you're doing Ruby text or uh, certainly a lot of Asian text layout, so if you're communicating with people in Japan in particular, uh, LibreOffice is probably your best shot to uh, be able to have Ruby text and have people that are just sending documents be able to load them and not be annoyed with you. Uh, LibreOffice had the great advantage in headers and footers, um, and the, there's the OD, one of the margin things in headers and footers basically um, was where I could crash LibreOffice. 
Um, surprisingly to me, background colours and headers and footers weren't widely supported, which I thought maybe people would want to have a lighter grey or something like that there, but again, um, this sort of gets back to the point that I was making that uh, if you're going through and meticulously testing all of these things for all of these office suites, you find some attributes that people just expect to work, which just don't work. Um, and other things that are uh, quite a lot more esoteric do actually work fine. Um, so perhaps, uh, well, it would be great if the outcome of what I've done uh, in some way influenced some of the office suites to implement more of the common facilities that are and not actually working at the moment, so that everyone gets to enjoy sort of better documents. I found with a lot of the headers and footers, uh, one of the example I have there with the dynamic spacing true, um, attributes are being loaded and saved in Word 2016, uh, but not everything. So there was just like a little tiny handful of things for headers and footers that worked okay. And I was sort of wondering, because if it's going to have to put headers and footers in its abstractions in memory, you know, why they didn't do all of the other or more common header and footer attributes and just like uh, strange dynamic spacing ones and sort of, well, how they came about the collection of attributes that they do actually respect when they load headers and footers, I suppose. Um, how was the testing done? Prior to uh, the automated testing, I've worked on uh, office shots, which if anyone's sending documents to other people, I highly recommend checking Office Shots out. It's a free service where you can upload, you can run your own server if you like, so you don't need to use, the, use other people's computers. But in the standard form, you can upload an ODT file and get back screenshots of, uh, or a PDF of how that looks in Word 2016 or other Office Suites. So you don't necessarily need to own Word 2016, but if you're gonna send it to someone who has Word 2016, you can see what they're going to see, basically. So it's uh, extremely handy in my opinion because nobody's going to have all of the office suites and you can just select and say, you know, this person's running OS X and they want LibreOffice 5, Does it, is it going to render the same way or are you going to run into issues where I have fonts and they don't have fonts because it's running on the, the server, so you're going to discover that. Uh, there was already ODF, uh, flickering screen, already ODF auto tests which I extended greatly. Um, and ODF auto results, which basically can generate entire harnesses, which take hours to run, because it's a lot of it's serial processing. I didn't get to the point of saying, uh, because it was sort of very hard to get that to work uh, without bugs. So in parallel, I'd really like, especially with Google Docs, just to say, and I have these 2,000 documents in the test suite, I'll just upload 2,000 documents in parallel and really hope that they don't sort of chop off my account for doing that. But, you know, you find that one way or the other. Um, so the test harness looks a bit like this, where in this case I'm testing an attribute uh, of colour and there's the value that I've got. And that generates a fairly simple document because in this case I'm just testing uh, plain text style. Uh, sometimes you can nominate in the test document to have multiple pages of sort of pseudo-random English because you want to be able to test margins or page breaks or things like that, which you can't do with just Hello World. And then the nastier stuff gets generated in the styles XML. So you have the, um, in this case, you're uh, selecting the attribute, uh, creating the middle basically with the inverse style. And on the next page, you're creating the main one and saying that your generated styles, parent style is the middle style. So if you have a transparent background, then the middle style will be made with some really horrible pink background. And that way you can see that it is transparent and it hasn't been moved around in the document. And basically, that's essentially the same thing, but with the, uh, the generation run, so you can see the background color of transparent and, ring and hot red in this case. Uh, a single run of it takes multiple hours. Uh, it can uh, attach to multiple machines, so if you're running LibreOffice on your, if you want to run this yourself, it's all open source, it's all available. Um, and you can sort of add new, um, new versions if you're running the uh, um, uh, Office 360, for example, and you want to see how well that's running. I sort of avoided running the subscription-based words because it's too much of a moving target. If I have, here's Word 2016, sort of with all of the patches applied, then it's more of a, um, more stable, I suppose. Um, Office Shots, which is, uh, I was mentioning earlier, where you can upload a, uh, an ODT or a, an ODF file and get back a PDF of the file. Um, you can run your own factory, which 
um, I've updated. So if you don't actually want to run a server, you can get the um, the Office Shots factory code, and then you run a bit of Python, and it looks around on your on the machine that it's on, and says, "Oh, I see you've got Caligula, and you've got Abbey Word, and then you've got LibreOffice 4 and 5, or you've got you know MS Word 2016." and will configure itself to be able to run ODT files through it, so you don't even need to have a server. You can download this, run the initialization, and it looks around, and then you can run things like um, the, the tool of LibreOffice 4 Writer, and here is the ODT file, and give me a PDF back of how that renders on this machine. So if you have a machine sitting in the corner and you want to use it to do uh, word renders, this will actually do it quite, quite happily over SSH. Um, there's a fair amount of overlap uh, between the existing Office Shots code, uh, which could, again, load and save and generate PDFs and things like that, and what I was doing in the, the auto tests. So in the auto tests, I've actually reused a fair amount of the, the previous Python code because it's there and it can configure and detect things. Um, some of the problems that I ran into, um, uh, finding infrastructure. Um, a lot of this, I was trying to do um, things like interacting with Google Docs. You want to you, you want to be able to do multiple thousand documents, but you don't specifically want to have your Google account being locked because you're somehow seen as a spam bot who's just sort of pummeling these ODT files at the thing. Um, trying to feed bugs upline is, is is hard, but I think the security thing needs to be handled slightly better. Um, knowing. Uh, Especially with Oasis and with ODF, there should be some sort of registry there, I think, so that companies that are doing it are closed source or... Because uh, a lot of open source places, you, you know where to submit bugs, but with the closed source, like for Microsoft, if you have a document that crashes Word, um, you may want to give that to them because, you know, yeah, secure, crashes are bad for everyone, basically. Um, security issues don't help anyone. So having some way of actually knowing in a lot of corporations that are large, um, where to, where to send that. I mean, I sort of pick on Microsoft there, but it's the same thing if I could manage to upload something to Google and it sort of didn't give a an ODF file back. I'd want to be able to sort of say, you know, why is this happening? Um, and possibly even have a version that does give me the ODF back and one that doesn't, and say maybe there's something happening at your end that I can't see. Um, of course, uh, licensing of products, I mean, funding's always going to be an issue as far as doing things like this goes. But working out licensing, uh, sometimes you need, uh, in this case, it was very difficult to get uh, Microsoft Word licenses to run this test on. I just wound up in the end basically going and buying a licensed copy of Word to, to run these things on. So um, if people are interested in this, um, I encourage you to look at Oasis and possibly get involved in the ODF specification because I should really have mentioned this at the very start that Open source to me is wonderful, but if you have a, a specification for documents that is flawed in some way, all the open source in the world doesn't help you, because if something's very difficult to do or um, has something that's computationally expensive, every open source implementation is going to need to respect what the standard is saying. So getting a good open standard is sort of much more valuable than having one specific open source implementation of that standard. Uh, Open Document Society uh, and LNET are quite interested in ODF stuff. Um, unfortunately, as far as Australia goes, I sort of haven't found that many places that are extremely happy with ODF and really want to push ODF as the Open Document standard. Perhaps the National Archives are probably the only place that springs to mind. Uh, the auto tests open document format org. If you want to see this huge matrix of what's failing and be able to drill in and see all of the content XML and styles XML. And various other things such as uh, how to install fonts and where to, get, uh, where to get fonts. And if you want to actually run all of the tests to verify things, if you think that some of my results are wrong, then the entire test harness is there to be sort of get cloned and you can run it on your machine. So I think I've well, it's really ended early, but... Okay, so uh, we have 10 issues left, so um, is there any questions? Hope for the best. 
Now, um, the, and Elnet decided basically to make a Google account and use its credentials for this so that, you know, because I didn't want to get my own personal account locked out. Um, I'm not entirely sure whether that was the right, yeah, yeah, whether that violates terms and conditions and things like that, but it was sort of on the edge. Like, eventually, if I did too much, then there'd probably be a nasty email or it'd just get locked out and uh, sort of try and handle it from there. someone got back to you and then, you know, I suppose they passed it around the company until someone from the right section replied to you. Did that happen at all? Um, yeah. Um, I, I had to report the security issues to a few people at Microsoft because, again, you sort of got a lot... It's not that people don't really want to know what you're saying. Uh, it's the fact that it's a large organisation and the guys who you happen to find aren't really on that team. Uh, but eventually I did get feedback saying, yes, we've, we've seen that. So, you know, I'm happy that... Um, well, it was sort of word of mouth feedback from someone else at Microsoft. <laughs> yeah, would have been nice to have like here is that email address of the guy, and uh, you know you can then start up a uh, you know if I find anything more, I can tell you about that, which would have been good. Um, so you mentioned uh, like graphical checking. Uh, how does that work? Do you use like OpenCV or OpenQA? Way or something like that? Um, yeah, not OpenCV, but more of the human touch. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, a lot of the um, because the the whole core of what I was doing was pre preserving data, so the actual rendering was really secondary to it. But um, if you have on the and there's a small thumbnail of the first page or multiple pages presented. So if you're doing a margin thing, you can fairly easily see. I make the margins. This was actually a bug in my initial version of the thing. I made the margin thing too small, so then I thought, on a page, I'll just make the margins three or four inches, and that way it's really obvious from a thumbnail whether or not the margins are being respected, because you just get this tiny little bit of text in the middle. So a lot of the checking at the moment is that way. Um, it would be interesting to do, and I had thought about trying to do automated image checks, but then you've got um, any aliasing of fonts and things like that, and different implementations, and if they change that, then the whole test suite breaks. So I think it, it would be interesting, but very difficult to do it. Uh, image comparison. Sort of on that, um, I haven't had heaps of experience with it, but uh, I know Percy does visual diffs, and it's more of an online tool, but they have like exclusion areas. Okay. So I think the idea is you could select that text area that you think alien, uh, anti aliasing is going to mess with and say diff everything but that section. I mean, that would work okay on the margins. Yeah. yeah. I'm certainly open to any suggestions. I mean, even if you only do, like, you know, trying to do everything at once is probably setting yourself up for failure. But if you, if you can just say, I'd like the margins to be white and anything that's inside the margins I don't care about, then that's, yeah, that'd work well. Okay, uh, in which case, uh, can you please thank our speaker?